Okay, welcome to the Operations Manual, Part 1. In this section, we'll talk about the introduction, the organization, and emergency procedures. First, when we look at the introduction, generally you're going to start your Operations Manual with a letter from you, the owner, identifying the purpose and scope of the Operations Manual, maybe some background information on the business itself. And then you're going to identify your mission statement and your values of the organization. Second, when we look at the organization, uh, first we're going to be able to describe the business and part of that you might take from what you've already created for your business plan. We're going to then create and develop that product and service description. Again, maybe you're going to pull that from what you've already created in your business plan document. Then we're going to identify critical organizational contact information. And with this, you, what you want to do, you want to have something in place of, if I am not here, if I become ill where I have to be in a hospital for a couple weeks, can people figure out how to run the organization without me there? And so, very important information to look at. First, the bank information. What's the at? And, and when we talk about any of the contact lists that we're going to be looking at, what's the name of the organization? What's the name of my contact person? Mailing address, email, and website, if applicable. And so, bank information, who's my banker? What's the address? Who's the people that I need to contact for that specific information? Then I should also have contact information for three of the services that I'm going to go out and contract for. Every business generally is going to have, um, at some point in time, an accountant, an attorney, and an insurance agent that they're dealing with. And so those are the three. You want to make sure you have those people's contact information there. We talk about emergency procedures. In case of emergency, who are the contacts? Now, sometimes you might have something tied into a security system where you have a contact list, who gets called when the alarm goes off. That information could be included here. But who is the emergency contact or contacts when there's an issue? And so this is where you're going to put your contact information. How are people getting a hold of you? And so you want your, obviously, your name, your address, your cell phone, email, whatever the best ways to get a hold of you in case of an emergency. If employees or if you notice that there's robbery, theft, or vandalism, what is the chain of command or what ac actions need to be taken by the people on staff at that moment? And you might have to refer to some legal documentations or do some additional reading and find out what you can and cannot do. Um, if you see this happening, uh, what are legal ramifications? Um, some of the places I've worked, one of the things we had was if you saw someone stealing something from uh, the place of employment, you really can't say anything until they have passed that last point of payment to make the purchase. Even if you see someone stuff something in their pocket, you might go and do some customer service, like, is there anything I can help you with? Oh, I see that. Um, you didn't have any place to put that. Would you like me to take it up to the register? But I can't accuse them of stealing until they leave past that last place of payment. And so there's really, the, uh, of, a lot of times in retailers, a two or three foot window from last point of payment to the exit. And so a lot of times we instructed our people, all you are to do is to, if you can, get their license plate number or a description. Do not go after the person. Do not try to tackle them. Do not try to apprehend them because now it's a whole new piece of legal issues that you're going to run into. They can, the person stealing from you can sue you if they get injured during that. Uh, you don't want your staff people to get hurt or injured in case they are carrying a weapon. And so a lot of times the best thing to do is just let them go and get as much of a description or contact information as you possibly can. What to do in case of an on-work injury or illness? 
a lot of times places will have procedures in place that don't necessarily make sense. Um, I remember one when I was really young, I worked as a dishwasher for a restaurant and one of our cooks was on a slicing machine and sliced off their thumb. And so they ended up getting written up because when they sliced off their thumb, like it was, it was like one of those situations where you had to put the thumb in a plastic bag and take plastic bag with patient to hospital. He got written up for not writing, not filling out paperwork before he went to the hospital. And so you wanna make sure that you have policies and procedures in place that make sense. I mean, clearly, if it's me and I slice off half my thumb, ah, I don't know if I'm gonna get around to paperwork. What happens if there's a fire or if you know there's a natural disaster? If you're in a situation where you have customers on site and there's tornado warnings, do you have policies in, in place to deal with if there's a tornado? Do you have a action plan of saying, here is the best room to go into, this is what we're going to do? And so it's important to have all of those things in place. It's much easier also for the staff and yourself dealing with that situation because it becomes a stressful situation. And so as much procedures you can have in place to deal with that, then you can handle that on a case-by-case -case basis. Thank you for watching this video on the operations manual. 